Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the second session of the second day of Networking at Scale Fall 2022 event. I am Bharat Parekh. I'm an engineering manager uh, within Traffic Protocols team at Meta. We had excellent presentation uh, on L4 routing consistency at Meta and highly available global traffic management at scale in AWS. We are going to have a Q&A session with our presenters. We have Andri and Aman from Meta and Ellen and Akshat from AWS. Welcome back, Andri, Aman, Ellen, and Akshat. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so let's see, I have a first question. Uh, this is related to uh, live stream connection st routing stability. Aman, you described the challenges in maintaining stable routing of live stream TCP connections. So the obvious question here is, why can't we use Quick for all live stream connections? Can you uh, share uh, or explain? That's a great question. Uh, and this has to do with the protocol that's used by third-party hardware encoders. They typically use RTMP over TCP and migrating them to Quick would take a couple of years. Now, as for live streaming protocols over Quick, there is one called Rush that we use for our uh, first party apps. So for example, if you take out your iPhone and you open up the Facebook app and you start recording a live stream through it, that goes out through Rush. Um, and there is a working group called um, Media Over Quick that's attempting to standardize Rush to provide the impetus for third-party hardware encoders to adopt it as well. But this is an effort that's going to take a couple of years. And until then, uh, we'll have to use the shared flow cache. I see, thank you. Are there any efforts that would help in uh, like uh, making this such a migration easier for quick? This is something that um, the IETF working group Media Over Quick is working on. I see. Thanks, Aman. That makes sense. All right. Uh, I'm going to switch over to Andre. Andre, this is a question for you. Um, uh, you described uh, regarding quick connection ID routing. Can you please explain how uh, the hint in connection ID works with quick connection migration capabilities? Yeah, so <clears throat> this was not uh, mentioned in the presentation, uh, but one of the motivation for doing um, connection ID routing support in uh, our L4 load balancer was to support uh, uh, connection migration. So quick supports uh, migrating connect, uh, connections from one um, network to another. It, the client IP address and port can change. And if we kept just using the um, portable of the uh, network connection, uh, as it changes, our load balancer would pick a completely different uh, backend server for that connection and essentially breaking it. Um, so uh, with the connection ID, uh, we can continue routing to the same backend um, even when client side IP address has changed. I see. Okay. Thanks, Andre. Um, all right. Uh, the next question is for you, Alan. Um, you describe return to sender in the packet flow inside the VPC. Can you share how does this work or how does this happen? Is there a sort of a special flag in the packet? Yeah, the uh, architecture that we use um, on top of virtual private cloud um, is. Uh, Obviously, it's a software-defined network. Uh, it uses um, an investment that we've made over several years in something called Hyperplane. And each of these EC2 instances has the ability for us to communicate um, to basically an offloaded um, uh, network processing device um, the control information about what to do with packets. So in a previous networking at scale, some uh, four or five years ago now, we talked about Hyperplane um, and this kind of routing problem where you can deliver a packet to an instance, the instance sees the originating source, and if it uses its local routing table, in many cases, we'll want to send the packet out uh, an internet gateway, or in some cases, it may want to send it off private connectivity, and that won't 
really work for a round trip connection. Um, and so we're able to communicate through signaling in the control plane um, that the uh, Nitro architecture, the, the component of the SDN, um, should be aware that this particular packet needs to be handled differently. And at that layer, when the packet is returned from the EC2 instance, um, that believes it's just following its normal route table, it is then intercepted in the packet processing um, pipeline takes over. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, all right. Um, next question is for Akshat. Um, you mentioned that you have four BGP speakers, each located in separate AWS region. How do you ensure that all respective regions won't go down at the same time, especially given that there are 21 AWS regions? Uh, so there are a couple of uh, aspects over there. Uh, we, we looked at the probability of failure for regions and when we have uh, availability zone level outage. And, and if we look at those probabilities, uh, we realize that the probability of four regions going down is very low and it's uh, lower than our availability SLA. And the second part to it is that uh, this is an anycast network. And even though for a given pop location, we are talking to four regions, overall, we're using 10 regions. So we uh, sort of shuffle shard the pop locations into those regions. So even if four of those 10 regions were to go down, we would only lose connectivity for a subset of those pop locations and we'll still be able to provide at least some level of service. I see. Uh, thank you. Um, there's a question. I think this question is for Aman. Um, how does the centralized flow cache manage its own failures or partial failures? Mm -hmm. Right. So within the centralized route store, we actually have three hosts. So there is some redundancy there. If one host goes down, then the other two hosts um, can still broadcast all of the connections to the load balancers. Now, uh, with other scenarios such as restarts, um, what happens there is that when one of the hosts starts up, it requests the other two hosts for their state so that it has all of the state upon initialization. And also in the case when there's um, some sort of a temporary disconnect between the centralized component and the backends, that's still okay because um, the backends periodically broadcast all of their uh, flows to the centralized component. So if there's some short time span uh, during which the centralized component is unable to receive uh, those flows, it'll receive it on a subsequent republishing. And we've observed that with these measures, um, the centralized components tend to be uh, in sync and up to date. I see. Thank you, Aman. Um, the next question uh, is for Andre. Uh, Andre, you describe a TCP option based solution. Uh, can you please share further detail in terms of how this works when IP packet carrying the TCP segment is fragmented? Um, it doesn't work with that. We, we just don't support, even for the TCP solution, um, you, without that solution, we just don't support uh, IP fragmentation in the, our load balancer. Um, it's it's doable, but the fragment supporting fragmentation requires it makes a big weakness and requires us to uh, store packets. Uh, and uh, since they can even arrive on different hosts, it's 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 really complicated to support for us. See, and but have you you have not seen this to be a big of a problem, and this has worked so far overall fine. Has it's been working for many many years, so. Um, um, I don't know. Doesn't hasn't been a problem. I see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question. Uh, this is question for you, uh, Ellen. Um, you touched upon a little bit about the fail open, and so can you share for the details about fail open behavior? What's the purpose of it? What scenarios it tries to solve? Um, uh, especially, and when does it kick in? Yeah, so what we've uh, learned over the years is that oftentimes 
when uh, an infrastructure seemingly goes dark from a health check perspective, particularly one that's horizontally scaled. Um, oftentimes, it traces back to uh, a deployment error or to um, kind of a misconfiguration. And there, it is frequently the case um, that the thing that's failing is the health check and not the actual availability of the service. And so if it's the case that there are kind of no endpoints that appear to be available, then uh, we fail open, which is to say we try to send packets to all of the available endpoints, even if they show us unhealthy, with the assumption that it's better to get some traffic through to a running system than no traffic through at all. Um, and that's kind of a, a, product of a product of experience and candidly customer desire. So customers tell us, well, if we've made an error in you know the the endpoint that you're testing for health checks, um, you know whether it's um, uh, you know path based or whether it's connection based on a particular port, if we've made some configuration error, if we changed something in the deployment, and the deployment still works but the health check specifically does not, um, please don't turn off our website. Send us traffic and let us know that there's an error. Um, and it's it's important to note that the way that it does work. And this is generally true in, in many of our services. Um, the way that it generally works is we're looking for um, all lights to be off, if you will. So complete failure of health checks across uh, all the endpoints. So if there's some subset of endpoints that are available, we will direct the traffic to the apparently healthy endpoints. Um, that can have its own consequences. Um, but uh, you know, through the magic of cloud and auto scaling and horizontal uh, elasticity, you know, we hope to help customers absorb those things. I see. Thank you, Alan. Um, the next question, uh, Akshat, this is for you. You During your talk, you touched upon the client IP preservation, especially with Global Accelerator. Can you share further details in terms of how does this work, especially when uh, uh, the TCP connection is terminated with at edge pop? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So uh, client IP preservation and TCP termination are actually orthogonal in some sense. Um, uh, what we do with TCP termination is that the TCP connection between the client and the edge location, there's one TCP connection over there and there's a separate proxy connection. You can think of it as a reverse proxy uh, that is at the edge, which then sets up a separate connection to the endpoint that's inside a region. Um, but <clears throat> But for client IP preservation, it works whether or not you have TCP termination. Uh, and the way it works is it essentially encapsulates packets uh, into an encap layer, which then goes through several layers of um, software-defined network. And when it actually lands on the endpoint, all of the encapsulation is gone and the client IP uh, looks, uh, looks like the original originating client's IP. Uh, and that works independent of whether or not TCP termination. So we can either take the original packet uh, from the client and encapsulate it, or we can take the proxy connections packet and encapsulate it. I see. So when a pro connection is proxied, it's it's encapped as well. And so that's how the client IP preservation works. Right. So we always use encap whether or not uh, it's a that proxy connection. Sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a kind of a little related question, a follow-up question for you again. Sure. Um, how does this work when an endpoint is not within VPC or that is never the case? So it will not work when the endpoint is not in a VPC uh, because it's relying on the capabilities of the VPC network that Lan Alan was talking about to be able to uh, deal with this encapsulation. Um, Global Accelerator actually currently, unlike CDNs, currently does not allow you to send traffic to outside of a VPC. Uh, but if it did, it would not work. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that detail. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to switch back to Aman. Aman, can you help explain why we can't use fill in TCP packet? Uh, to embed routing information for TCP connection between client and edge, like for example, timestamp. 
Right. Um, so embedding the routing information within the timestamp field is something that we did consider. But I would say that there are two major issues uh, with doing that. Um, the first is um, the operational work related to that. So what I mean to say is that rolling out um, this change and monitoring it would be more difficult than what we have with the shared flow cache. And also, um, we would have to be more vigilant of um, changes in the kernel related to, um, for example, timestamp randomization that might affect this work. And the second issue is that there might be security implications of disabling timestamp randomization and inserting a server ID within the timestamp field. Thank you, Aman. Um, right. Uh, this is a question. I think this is a question, Ellen, for you. Um, uh, does global exeter work for HTTPS? Does customer have to upload the cert? So as uh, Akshat mentioned, um, Global Accelerator is, is really operating at layer three, four. And so, you know, whether or not the, the backend is HTTP or HTTPS or whatnot, it's not particularly material to, to Global Accelerator. Now, the endpoint itself may have certs and such, um, but there's not a, a particular requirement there. Akshat will correct me if I'm misstating, but uh, that is, uh, that's the operational mode. We do have obviously um, layer seven capabilities. In fact, that Global Accelerator can, Global Accelerator can integrate with, in which case you might have a cert that's, uh, that's sitting there. Uh, you're right, Alan. Everything above the TCP layer is essentially passed through. So uh, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS doesn't really matter. I see. Uh, so it's kind of a related question. You mentioned that so for global accelerator, TCP connection is terminated at the edge. Does that mean that this actual SSL handshake happens between the endpoint and the client and the global accelerator does not play any role in the in there? That that's exactly right. Yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to switch back to Andre for this next question. Um, Andre, there is a quick ITF group or uh, has a spec or rather ITF spec about the quick load balancer. Do you support that in Katran? Or also, can you please explain how the quick connection ID based routing that is in, uh, you describe is different from the SPAC? Thank you. Yeah, we, we've been watching that SPAC closely. Um, a few of our team members uh, are all actively involved in a quick working group. Um, if I remember correctly, the earlier versions of um, the spec uh, used to have a similar scheme that we implement in Catran, um, slightly different, maybe like bits and offsets, but I, the, the general idea was pretty much the same. Uh, but over the years, the spec evolved, and um, the current one is um, something we plan to implement in future. Um, it is a better version using encryption and more sophisticated uh, ways to handle ours, quite simple. Um, so yeah, in, in, in short, we plan to do that. Um, our ours ours is um, the benefit is it's very very simple uh, to use, but um, it's it's a trade off. Okay, thank you, uh, Andre. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we have time for one more questions. Um, Ellen, I'm going to ask this question to you. This is relevant to Global Accelerator. You mentioned that for Global Accelerator, Global Accelerator, you get two static IP, two IPv4 and two IPv6. Can you share further details in terms of how two separate static IP, what role does it play in providing a better uh, uh, availability? Sure. So in the, the design of the, the service, um, a lot, uh, as you can uh, tell from Akshat's uh, discussion in the session, a lot of effort was put into um, delivering resiliency, right? Significant levels of resiliency, so four and a half nines. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is that each of these networking zones really is designed to be fault isolating. And so the notion here is that if you're using both of these addresses, uh, then in the case that there is 
an issue with one zone in total. And we already have, I think we mentioned actually, and I know I mentioned in the session that we even have cellular architectures within the zones to try and kind of mitigate even kind of intra-zone issues. But if there were an operational event in, in one of those zones, we want uh, the customer to be able to have uh, kind of a minimal impact. And so the second IP address being announced from the same location, a separate set of devices allows us to give that experience to the end user. Um, if you think about it from just kind of a simple um, kind of uh, connection renegotiation perspective, et cetera, et cetera, we're already kind of doing our bit to influence the direction of traffic to the kind of low, uh, lowest cost, by some definition of lowest cost, a uh, reasonable edge. And so if two IP addresses were, both IP addresses were advertised out of the same network zone, then customers would start going through a routing, uh, a rerouting exercise, uh, which would potentially uh, provide a meaningful impact to the customer experience. So those are the two IP addresses that we advertise, same pop, different network zones. Again, from a resiliency perspective, we found that to be the, the target. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it to Akshad if he wants to add anything else as a, an engineer that was intimate in this process. Uh, you covered most of the points there, Alan. Uh, yeah, so our goal really is that uh, even if a pop location is functional, and there are some other software <clears throat> defects, we would still be able to get traffic in from one of the two or two of the four IP addresses uh, into that pop location. And we found that for, for the most part for HTTP applications, because they are uh, relatively good at sort of failing over based on DNS resolution, like if they find two IPs and one of them isn't working, they will fail over to the other one. So it's fairly transparent. I see. Thank you. I think uh, I would love to continue this discussion. It's really interesting, but we are almost at the end of the Q&A session. We are pretty much out of time. Uh, so I want to thank all our speakers to, for taking the time and having such an interesting discussion. Also, I want to thank everyone that joined uh, us for this panel and asked uh, for such insightful, insightful questions. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this concludes our second day of Networking at Scale Fall 2022 event.